This is Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. And they can't fight this either. Here's my question. Yes. And maybe I just don't understand. Oh, so, okay. So Friday night, I, I go to see a performance. I go to see a musician. I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not going to cosplay. So right. I, I dress like I normally dress. So for a, a show like this, when it's kind of brisk out, I'll, I'll go with a button down shirt, some jeans, yeah. have a great time. The problem with that is that a lot of the bands I go see when I dress like that, I look like I'm there from the city to investigate a noise complaint. Okay, this is true. And I'm going to shut the whole darn thing down if there's any more of this wackiness. That's and true. You, at, you, you, you tend to exude something that you're not. Yeah, I tend to you're exude- You're way cooler than you look. That, that I'm miserable and uh, right. yeah, don't have time for this. So- right. When actually, like, you have nothing but time for this because it's what you love. And right, you exactly. Cool and get it. And everyone is jumping up and down and screaming, shake hands with beef. And I'm having a great, as great a good time as everyone else. Yes. By the way, little mix up on my part. Um, Chicago does not sing Winona's Big Brown Beaver. So I should not have been yelling that Probably all night. was not the best show to sing that at. Yeah, no. During the intermission... I went out to there the was bar. An intermission? There was an intermission. They played 23 songs. This was Chicago expanded. Okay. So I would hold this up, but you won't be able to read it. There we go. Very briefly. They had three drink specials. Okay. For last night's show. Mm-hmm. And so I want to read you the title of the drink and I want you to guess what is in it. Oh, okay. Okay. So the first drink, $12. It is called The Inspiration. To go that, back to our conversation about wanting to be there with Satan. It. it does. What else? Oh, I got to go beyond that? I think um, so. If there's some cranberry in there? You are spot on. <laughs> wow, it's like Va- a Rose, Rose Kennedy Plus. Or a Cape Cotter, yep. Yeah. A uh, Grey Goose uh, with cranberry. Um, uh, but there's nothing additional nope cape cotter there you go all right um follow up the uh second drink of the night of the three was something called the leave me now which again not a great name for a drink not really who wants to call over a bartender and then be like leave me now right yeah. But if you know the song, it'd be like something you'd want to hold on to. Savor. Right. Yeah. No, there was a lot of lighters. Anyway, the biggest part of me. Yeah. Oh. Which for me, that would have tequila in it, but I don't feel like it's tequila. It's not tequila. Um, is it gin? No. Whiskey? No. Back to vodka? Yes. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, so it's Pinnacle Raspberry Vodka, and then there's something else that goes along with that. Hmm, interesting. Keep in mind this was at a casino. Right. What would you put with your Raspberry Vodka? Oh, I'm sorry. Thinking. Like Sprite? You are right on. <laughs> you are two for two here. Oh. Last one is called the Chicago. Is that like Jack and Coke? I give up. I give really? Up. Yeah. That's hilarious. That's wow. Amazing. Now we so, found my hidden talent. I know. Wake, <laughs> wake the kids. Randy, Woo-hoo. wake up. We found out what Heidi's good at. Hello, kitties. We're going to have a real good time together. And do you know why? Because why? we are not going to take it. Anymore. Anymore. No. <laughs> We talked okay, with why? Why? Because we want to rock. Well, clearly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are we out of practice with this or what? I think well, we are a little out yeah. of practice. But it is uh 
it is JJ French week, which means it's Twisted Sister week. Yes. And he's got a fascinating new, what is he called? A biz memoir? Bizwar, I think. Something like that. Something different. We better check that. Biz, not bizography. What is it? I thought it was Bizwar. You know, we I should check it. it. Bizwar, and we and we but can. I think it's like biz, yeah. But, we'll but I'm not cutting this part out. Um <laughs> uh, Bizwar. Yep. Bizwar. Part uh, memoir, part business primer. Primer or primer? What would you say? See, I go back and forth. It's primer. Yeah, it should be. But uh, JJ has learned a lot from his life of not taking it. Right. And he now imparts all of that wisdom to us. Yeah. The great unwashed masses. It's good. It's not just about this time with Twisted Sister, though. It like, goes prior to that when he was a revolutionary in school and a drug dealer and all kinds of other things. And the book and then our conversation with JJ too gets a great chance to rub our noses in all of the cool bands he saw that we did not see. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so thanks, thanks we for that, JJ. about ourselves, which yeah. is much like going to a Tony Robbins. Thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, less fire walking with JJ. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But as someone who really doesn't love business books. I thought you were going to say fire walking. No, well, we'll get to that. I'm going to try it again. <laughs> um, this book is far more digestible and far more interesting. Like, we felt bad that we didn't get to see these bands, but we didn't feel like losers. True. Yeah. I and mean, no more so than usual. Right. And it was a really yeah. interesting way of giving the, I don't know, the insight. the book it's really interesting i feel like there are times in my life when i say man if this doesn't become a chapter in my book you know nothing will or i hope i i get a good story out of this you know was that something you said to yourself throughout your career you know at the risk of sounding like a self-absorbed narcissist like there's any other kind of narcissist go for it the answer is um somehow at the age of 17, I was, I was uh, hanging out in Ocean Beach Fire Island one summer, and, or I was 16, and I was, you know, on acid and on the, on the beach watching a sunset, and they're all, my, my friends were walking around in bell bottoms, and, you know, on the beach, it was in the early morning in the summer of 68, uh, and I said to myself, man, when we're 70, we're going to be the only generation of 70-year-olds that took acid. This is what I said to myself. I said, I wonder what that's going to be like. I wonder what that's going to be like, because I wonder how many of us are going to last long enough to have said I wore bell bottoms. So that was the first conscious, me being aware of saying, pay attention to what you're seeing, because it is such a phenomenon that will likely not be repeated that you should know it. So that was issue one. As I was going to the Fillmore East and seeing all of these shows on a weekly basis, you know, whether it was Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Country Joe and the Fish, Can't Heat, whatever. Uh, Neil Young, Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Who, every week, every weekend, like it's nothing, you know, like ticket to three bucks, like it's nothing. And if you couldn't afford the $3, you saw the same acts in Central Park for a dollar. I kept thinking, perhaps this will never happen again. And you should kind of make a mental note that watch, what you are watching is likely going to be historically important. So I started keeping things like ticket stubs and, and, and brochures from the Fillmore and the Carnegie Hall shows. I mean, you know, seeing James Taylor for the first time at Carnegie Hall, C.B. Wonder for the first time at Carnegie Hall, you know, and keeping those books, you know, seeing Sinatra. I, I mean, I don't care if it was Elvis. 
you know, and I was at so many of these shows. And, and so I could say to you, okay, I was at really important shows. You go, really? Well, a lot of people were. I said, no, not really. I can prove it to you. Um, I have six albums, live albums, meaning that there was important enough for the artist to release a live album. So you have Elvis at the Garden in 1972, Rolling Stones at the Garden in 1969, the band Rock of Ages at the Academy of Music, Jimi Hendrix, a Band of Gypsies, uh, uh, New Year's Eve 1970, um, uh, the Grateful Dead at, uh, well, I have a number of Grateful Dead concerts, They've all been released on albums, uh, John Mayall's Turning Point. I was at every one of those shows, not because I was a genius, but because I was at every one of those shows because I was at every one of those shows. And those shows were all made into live albums, which means that the artist thought enough of those shows to make a live record, which means I was at the right place at the right time, listening to the right artists for the right music. So there's a long answer to your question. I, I, I really became fully aware of this thing. And then here's what really hit me. In 1970, when the Kent State kids were killed, in Kent, you know, Kent State murders. Mm -hmm. I was living with my girlfriend in Richmond, Virginia, who was the great granddaughter of Robert E. Lee. And the only reason why she was dating a Jew drug dealer from New York was to scare the hell out of her mother. Of course. And Which it checked all the boxes. Yeah. That, checked, that checked all the boxes. <laughs> right. He's Jewish, he's a hippie, he's a drug dealer. Oh my God, what better way to make your mother <laughs> really freaking upset? And, and so I met her in Bermuda the summer before that. And because her father got a job, he, you know, running a department store in Bermuda, long story, but it doesn't matter. The point is, she, um, she said to me, why don't you come and live with me? And I dropped out of high school with two months to go to go live with her, much to my mother's shock, horror, and dismay. But then again, I was also involved in anti-war demonstrations and civil rights demonstrations and the drug dealing and playing in a band. So I was multitasking. And I remember going down, I'd never been south of Brooklyn, New York. And I take a bus down to Richmond, Virginia, and I'm sitting on her stoop uh, of her of her house on uh, Monument Avenue. In fact, right by where the Robert E. Lee Monument has just been taken down. That's a great grandfather. And uh, and she was at work that day and I brought my electric guitar and so I'm kind of like messing around. And all of a sudden I hear these police sirens and the, the University of Richmond exploded because the colleges all over America on that day, May 4th, went crazy like crazy they burned down the rotc headquarters i remember sitting thinking man john you're sitting here on may 4th 1970 and uh you know you're 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 you know, you're 18 years old and and uh and this is crazy shit like this is crazy and you know and are you ever going to see the year 2000 because you're going to be 48 years old in 2000 what's that even going to be like to that 30 years from now I remember distinctly remembering that. And so the, again, the long answer to your question is um, when they say that if you remember the sixties, you weren't there. Well, I was there and I remember clearly just about everything I did. And that enabled me to, you know, put that in the book and make it interesting. It's interesting too, because hearing you, you know, say this and then also from reading the book, you know, so often people talk about being an old soul. And I, I feel like if that's true, if that's possible, that's something that you are because from you had this foresight to see the significance of where you were. And also through every stage of your life, starting at such a young age, you're changing the world and for good, bad, or indifferent in various different ways and sort of taking lessons from that. I feel like you took lessons from a much earlier age than most, pe most people do and translated those into beneficial things for further down the road. So I heard a cliche many years ago, and I think I am a living embodiment of that cliche. And the cliche is there's three kinds of people in the world, the people who make it happen, the people who watch it happen, and the people who say what happened. And 99% of the people in the world say what happened. And I swore to myself, I'd either make it happen or watch it happen, but I would never say what happened. I was gonna be fully aware of everything that went down around me. So I could not blame somebody else for it except me um, and that's a very, oh, I don't know, high-minded view of the world, right. you know, but, the, and my mother was a very high-minded intellectual, you know, when my mom was on her deathbed, I remember uh, saying to her, um, you know, if you die, how am I going to vote? Because I always followed her lockstep, you know, mm -hmm. and she looked at me and she, she gave me this, these, these words of advice. She said, look, 
Um, economy goes up and down, wars come and go, it's all bullshit. So all that matters is, is the Supreme Court. And if you vote for the kind of person that would put the kind of person on the Supreme Court that you would like, you will never make a mistake. That's what she said. You will never, ever make a Put away all the other noise and just say, does this person who I'm voting for, given the opportunity to place a justice on the Supreme Court, place the kind of justice that I want to see on the Supreme Court? And you will never make a mistake. And that has been my guiding principle. Now, they say that most voters are one issue voters. Those issues usually are economic. You know, like, do I get a bigger paycheck tomorrow? And, and I understand, I get that. I do understand that that can be important to some people. Sure. My mother's view was much more existential, much more intellectual, much more fascinating to me, because that allows you to go, well, I could hate, Hil I could hate Hillary, but it doesn't matter because she put the kind of person on the Supreme Court that I like. Or you could say, I. I don't like Donald Trump the way he speaks, but he'll put the kind of person, you know, it goes on both sides. Right, you know, it, it really covers both sides. So if you like that kind of person, they'll put that kind of person on. That's, that's it. So that, you know, that'll give you an, an insight into my thinking. Um, that, that's how my mom raised me. And, and while that's all going on, you know, on my mother's deathbed, you know, I, I you know, I informed her, that yes, you know, I had stopped doing drugs and I was totally clean, but that I was in a transvestite rock band. So I don't know which was a worse piece of news for her, you know, to come back from. But the book, what I love about the book is the book really tells the whole story in a way that I like to think it weaves it all it together. does, which is so rare. And I, I'm stealing what I was overhearing your conversation with Luke yesterday, but it's it's so rare that you can take both the, not sensationalism, but both like the excitement of the story of what you went through, but, and also the business wherewithal and the life lessons and actually have them both come through really strongly. And I think that's what makes it really fun because I hate business books. I love rock bios but I also am always trying to you know figure out the story of life and work and how to make our shows better and so to get have it packaged in a way that I digest and would you know devour regardless is perfect yeah there's more Which heroin is, than who moved my cheese right and I'm mm. way more about the you know I don't do heroin <laughs> but I'd rather read about someone's experience with heroin and overcoming heroin than uh where the cheese is yeah, you know, the, the uh, first of all, that's why I coined the phrase biz war, which I give myself a pat on the back, because I think yes. every book is going to be called a biz war after this, It's like a sitcom, because <laughs> how could how can a book about any business person not be a biz war? It's, right. it's, it's, it's the experiences the person had in life gives them the philosophy that they have a business. There's no way to dissect it. There's no way to split it up in every book. They want to hear about Steve Jobs. It's a biz war. You want to hear about this guy, Andrew Carnegie. It's a biz war. It's like how he grew up, how they grew up, male, female, they, thems, whatever. That's how your philosophy is ultimately going to be. You know, what your life taught you is how you're going to kind of, you know, take it through. The, 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 the crazy thing about the drug scene is that um, it was five years compacted. I mean, it was really, it was crazy and in the middle of it, but I didn't think it was crazy in the middle of it because everybody was crazy in the middle of it. You know, we all mm -hmm. were. And I think all of our parents in the sixties, I think the, I think most of our parents just hung a white flag and just gave up. I mean, really, you know, there were no helicopter parents in those days. They were, in fact, they were escaping parents. It was like, let me get this far away from these insane kids as I can, because I don't understand the music. I don't understand the politics. I don't understand the drugs. You know, you think about the difference between my parents and me. Now, my mother was different, but in general, the parents in my generation versus me and my daughter, you know? So, I mean, think about this. How many parents today go, oh, my kids, are, we listen to the same music. We love the same stuff. Well, I guarantee you don't listen to gangster rap, okay? <laughs> guarantee you really don't listen, you know, to gangster rap. But the point is, is that my parents never, could care, you know, and my father thought everything after 1948 sucked. I mean, he made it really simple. He kind of just really made it simple. He says, you know what? 1948 after baby, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. All sucked. Life was so much simpler then. 
you know, to be able to just say that, you know, uh, it just, it, you know how they go like all country sounds the same and all rap sounds the same and all metal sounds the same. Yeah, to the untrained ear, it all sounds the same because you don't care enough to know the difference. You know, if you know the difference, you could sit there and go, well, of course that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. My father was a classical music guy. He knew, he could listen to QXR and go, oh, that's Schubert's Mass in F minor, uh, recorded by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 94. Great for him. That's what he loved. And the challenge for me is to not turn into my dad when my daughter, you know, came to me one day and played Britney Spears' version of Satisfaction, which was amongst the worst things you could ever hear in your life, you know? And, and it was awful. I mean, she thought it was great. And, and I said, well, this is a teachable moment. I'm now going to play you, the Rolling Stones, you know, this is arguably the greatest single ever recorded. And I play it Satisfaction, to which she replied, that sucked. And I thought, if I kill you now, there's a good <laughs> chance that a jury of my peers may find me innocent. Yeah. Justifiable and fantasy. <laughs> so at that point, I had to learn how to shut my mouth and let her have her thing. Yeah. You know, which was a which was also an adult. You know, moment. Has she has she since come around? After years of tasering and being chained <laughs> to a table, she Perfect. now admits that the Beatles and Queen are the best bands that ever existed. Actually, though, there's a there's a kind of cute story to that. One day, she asked me to go see a friend of hers band in the in the on the Lower East Side, in some basement, you know, on the Lower East Side. So of course I go, you know, and it's perfectly horrible. And we walk out of it. And she goes, Dad, what do you think? And I said, Can I ask you a question, Sam? I said, You know the Beatles, you know Queen, you know the, you know what's great. How do you, how can you like that? And you know, her answer to me was stunning, and it shut my mouth completely. She said, uh, Let me go back. When I was thirteen, and the Beatles were, you know, real time. Right. And we got all this music in real time. You know, so we were buying the new Kinks record, the new Stone, uh, everything's in real time. We all had little bands. Okay, we all had little bands. I'm sure they sucked beyond words, but it was all neighborhood kids playing, right? And of course, we had the greatest bands in the world <laughs> at our fingertips on the radio, 24-7, greatest bands in the world in real time. And we're these little bands of like 13, 14-year-old kids playing and to our friends. And uh, we, I'm sure we sucked. I'm sure we were awful. And, and my daughter looked at me and she goes, and I said, how do you like that? How could you like that? And she goes, because they're mine, dad. In other words, they're my friends, you know? It's my friends trying to figure it out. That's why I asked you to come down. And I went, you know, I should just shut up. You know, I just really should just take a lesson from that because she was 100% right. Yeah, In the that's book, fair. Yeah. In the book, you talk about the kind of that long time it took Twisted Sister to become what you became, to sort of get a record label, get a deal that will hold water for more than 48 hours. Um, what do you think was the thing that kind of kept you going? Because I know at one point you had that, I'm going to give this one more year. What was that before that to get to your 10,000 hours? Was it just... We, we were extremely fortunate to come through a, a time... Uh, period in the New York, New Jersey, tri-state area in which the club scene supported the bands. Mm. And if you were really good, they really supported your bands, you made a lot of money. You know, the S in the Twisted Method is stability. And, and what that spoke to was um, understanding that if you're going to have a guy, if you're going to have a band work or any company work towards a vision, the company has to be stable enough to be able to, to last over a certain period of time. And and there's a quote from Duke Ellington that I lead in that chapter. And it said, uh, you know, to keep a band together, you need a gimmick. My gimmick was to pay the musicians, which is a very funny line. Okay. But in truth, you know, early on, we had a meeting and I said, well, how much do we all need to make a week in order so that all you need to do is this? That's it. And they, we all came to a figure of how much we needed to make a week. And I said, okay, so if we can make that a week, this is our goal, right? So, yeah, so that was number one, the ability to be economically stable. That's a really important. And number two, the scene was mind blowing. I mean, here we are playing within a 100 mile radius of Manhattan and there's hundreds of clubs, hundreds. Drinking age is 18. Well, the drinking age is 18. Don't you think there's a lot of 15, 16, 17 year old kids with phony proof made it in shop class? Because in those days you take a pencil and you freaking do an outline of a license and you got away with it. Thousands of kids. So when you have thousands of kids and mega clubs, 
This allows you to um, lick your wounds of rejection in the afternoon after you get a letter from a record label and go back out and play to 4,000 people that night. And the 4,000 people love you. And so if they love you, it gives you more energy to go after it the next day. We had the luxury of immense local popularity that allowed us time to get our shit together and become better. And that's really, I, you can't say it enough. And Dee became a better songwriter. We became better performers. You know, it went on year after year after year after year. When it started in the 73, you know, it, it, so ACDC, Twisted Sister, Kiss, Judas Priest all started in 73. If you asked us in 73 individually how long we were going to last, I'm sure the answer would have been five years. That was a standard line. You know, five years, man, we're going to make it big or whatever. Ten, the Beatles were only around 10 at that point. So they had the longest reign of a band from 60 to 70. That's if you were a true Beatle fan, you knew they started in 60. Most people in America did not know that. They thought they started in 63 or 64, but it was 10 years. And I knew that. Um, but I would have thought five. Here we are 49 years later and Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, Tw Twisted Sister, you know, selling records, having a life. Who the hell knew? I mean, who knew? So it was a weird combination of extraordinary events in the bar days and then continuing its own strange trip through the classic rock period. And now here we are almost 50 years later. Yeah. It's fascinating. Do you think it was that you guys would have succeeded at any other time in music? That's impossible to, for, it's impossible to answer. I, I can't say everybody, you know, everybody's story is like a snowflake. Everyone's got an individual story. I mean, I like to say that everyone has a story to tell, but most people shouldn't write about it. Right. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, really, I don't really need to hear your bullshit. So I shouldn't say. Um, but uh, I, I, you don't know. I mean, whatever, whatever, um, confluence of circumstances and coincidences kept this ball going is unique to this ball. You know, I mean, a band is almost like a combination lock. You know, you keep turning that dial until you find the five clicks that open the safe because, you know, this click is bad, that click is bad, this click is bad. Obviously in the story, that click is bad, this click is bad. I'm going through a lot of bad clicks. Uh, the fact that it lasted makes for a great story. The fact that I kept diaries makes for even a better story. The fact that I thought enough to make a diary to, 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 and keep all the records makes even a more fascinating story because someone said, why, why did you think it could possibly have made it? Because remember, if it didn't make it, you wouldn't be interviewing me. If it didn't make it, I'd have a box full of information that nobody gives a shit about. Mm -hmm. So let's just say it's a wonder that we did enough to be able to show you my brilliance of being able to have to show proof that we did. But you know what? That's a funny statement to me. I, I don't know what would have happened if it didn't happen. And it almost didn't happen on a number of occasions. Yeah, the band did break up. Mm -hmm. The band collapsed. I write about it. The band collapsed. We all lost everything after that struggle. You know, the book starts with me having a conversation with my brother in which he asked me how I, how I, you know, how my life is my life because it's gone up and down and up and down and up and down to the point where I say we were turned down more times in a bed sheet and come back more times than Freddy okay. Krueger and Michael Myers. But most people's lives are like that too. I mean, many people's lives are like that. So the book, the, the, the twisted method of reinvention is I think a, um, a guide towards dealing with really tough times in your life and, and, um, and, and getting through it because the, my story, while it's rock and roll and it's sexy, because it is rock and roll and everybody wants to read about that, it's no different from any other business that winds up succeeding. I mean, that's what makes the book so much fun for me is that it works everywhere. That's why I do my motivational speaking for banking companies and travel agencies, because it doesn't matter. It's the same shit, you know, it's the same politics it's the same problems you know overcoming challenges you know I, there's so many cliches about the business world you know that are thrown around all the time you know it's not how many times you get knocked down it's how many times you get back up there's all these cliches what i want to do in the book is say okay here's the deal this was the problem this is how we viewed it this is what our response to it was and this is what happened afterwards bing 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 not some high-minded nonsense. It's actually this, 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 and this. And you'll read it and go, whoa, that was fucked up. Whoa, that's what, 
Well, that's what they, and that's what happened. That's what makes it so practical. You know, Joe Lewis has one of the best quotes in the world where he says, when you get knocked down in a fight, you can't get back up so fast that they don't know you got knocked down. So take the damn 10 count and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I tell people this in business all the time. You can't pretend it didn't happen. You know, you have to really kind of look at your failures and you have to analyze your failures and you really have to be coldly analytical about your failures. You know, and most bands think they're great. You know, most bands, are, I'm the greatest. You know, well, just because someone says you suck doesn't mean you don't suck. You may really suck. You know, and, and if you do suck, figure out a way not to suck. Mm -hmm. You know, people told us we sucked. And we went, okay, they may have a point there. I don't agree there. They may be right there. I don't agree there. So let's figure out the stuff that we can agree on. Let's move on and see if we're right. Okay, sounds like a brilliant brilliance, right? That's that's how you that's how you did it. We didn't automatically assume that every time we got a criticism, they were wrong. We looked at the criticisms and went, they got a point there, or we don't agree with that, or whatever. But uh, you know, it's that constant rejiggering, retooling. I always talk about how you get over this stuff. You know, you when you get rejected, you can mourn it. You know, then you can reflect on it, then you can retool and you re reapply. That's the same formula for every business in the world. In fact, that's the same formula for life. That's the same formula for divorce. You know, if you go through a divorce, what do you do? You mourn it, reflect on it, you think about what you may change next time, and you go out and apply it. It's the same thing. These are universal truths. I'm so proud of the book because I never took any formal training. You know, I'm a high school dropout. So this is all learning on the job stuff. When I talk to people who've taken business courses and they throw crap at me with the business course, I say, man, you don't know the reality. <laughs> you don't know the real world. You know, this is not the real world. This is the real world. Yeah. Well, I think that is what's so interesting in just having that ability to see those elements that maybe weren't just straight ahead of you, like owning the name, you know, things like that, those different elements. Why, why do you think it's so hard for people to truly self-reflect and look at their failures and look at what went wrong and the role they played? Well, one thing I'm not is I'm not a therapist. <laughs> True. And I don't know. I don't know. I know that um, it, it defies logic that every human being in the world can be successful because I don't think we're wired that way. And, you know, you need the worker bees and you need the leaders and the followers. And all that stuff. It, so it defies logic. You know, when I listen to these like self-help gurus and says, who basically say everybody can do this and number one and um, what was the other the one that is everything. Oh, and then and, you, and it's never enough. Number two, both of those things bother me because they're not true. Not everybody can do it. Because if everybody could do it, we'd all be gold medal winners for the Olympics. So not everyone's getting up at four o'clock in the morning to figure skate for eight hours. It's just not happening. It's just a tiny little group is gonna do that, okay? Um, how many people are gonna play 9,000 shows trying to get a record deal? Like that many, maybe. Now, how many people are gonna practice eight hours a day on a violin for 30 years to become first chair at Philharmonic? Maybe that much, okay? So there's a built-in Ponzi scheme. That's number one, or built-in built pyramid problem. That's number one. Number two, the theory that Tony Robbins, these guys throw out, you know, like it's never enough. That's a sickness. And I don't agree with that either. You have to be able to sit back and go, man, you know, you have to. Like, what's the point? Like, are you gonna just always keep striving and never enjoy what the hell you're doing? Um, the entertainment business is a what have you done for me lately business. We live in the absolute epicenter of the mentality of reinvention. So as much as COVID has had a destructive effect on the world and, 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 and people have had to rethink their life and their families and all that, entertainment business is the worst because you can have a hit record or a hit movie. And the first thing they interview you is, so what's your next project? It's like, give me a freaking break. You know, can I just enjoy this one for five minutes? Right. So we become accustomed to the what have you done for me lately world, which is why the reinvention part comes so natural to us. It's very scary for people to reinvent. It's terrifying. And look, I, I've had to reinvent whether I liked it or not, which is what I address in the book. I address proactive versus reactive chaos. You know, that's a pretty high-minded philosophy for someone who comes out of a non-business 
right. world. You know, mm -hmm. people go, what's proactive and reactive chaos? It's a proactive, reactive chaos is when shit happens to you and you're not ready for it. You have to come and make a decision on the dime and it's terrifying. Proactive chaos is when you got to shake the plane up and you know you have to shake the plane up and to save yourself, you've got to shake the damn plane up and you're terrified, but at least you have a little bit of notice ahead of time. So you can put the flak jacket on and put the helmet on, you know, and that's proactive chaos. Every business goes through proactive chaos at some point, you know, something's wrong. We have to really change things up and you do something drastic. That's business. That's life. You know, when you get a divorce, you either you either plan on the divorce or the divorce hits you like over the head out of nowhere. If you're the person that would hit you over the head out of nowhere, that's reactive chaos. If you're the one that planned the divorce, that means that you've already thought ahead of time. How many chess moves ahead you have to make in order to get over it? Well, when I filed for bankruptcy, I thought 10 chess moves ahead because it was terrifying. It was terrifying. When I went to my second divorce, it was reactive because my wife just sprung that on me. That was a tougher thing to handle. Um, when I was 22, I go into this thing in the book about my first real depression going through the girl, the girl I was in love with breaking up with and my mom dying and the band breaking up all in the same week. I had never been unhappy in my life until that week. And that week threw me into a tailspin and put me in a nine month depression, which I, cons I considered suicide. And uh, I don't take depression lightly. Um, I talk about it in depth in the book because I really am amazingly empathetic to anyone who's in that dark, dark hole. My reaction to the dark hole was to keep a diary, which I started keeping a diary therapeutically, which became an, a tool, which I discuss in the book. It's a very important tool, um, regardless of why you keep a diary. The reason why a diary is so good is that because if you keep diaries for very long periods of time and you get through really tough times, you, grief, you go back when you're having a tough time. You go, I got through there. I did that. I got through that. Wow. So I can get through the next one. Anyway, I, I did not go to a therapist, and I should have. I did not ask for psychotropic drugs, which I should have because I was in such deep emotional pain. What happened, however, was nine months after the, the, the depression hit me, I woke up one, after, one morning and I had no pain. Well, I got an eight hour sleep instead of three. And I went, well, this is a mistake, right? There's a mistake, I feel good. There's gotta be a mistake. I'm sure tomorrow I'll feel crappy. And I woke up the next day, I felt great. And I thought, okay, so depression, in its most innocuous form, it's like a cut on the wrist, and given time, it will heal. I do not offer that as a, as a prescription to anybody, because ever since that happened, if I even remotely got into that state of mind, I w ran to a therapist. I will not allow myself to fall that deeply in. Again, these are lessons to people that I hope they take, and they think, wow, if there's a heavy metal musician that's writing all this stuff, it sounds like, so this is my life. And if you can't do something positive, what the hell is the point? And, you know, my daughter has an eye disease called uveitis, which is the leading cause of blindness among girls in America. We deal with that. I had two heart operations because I had atrial fibrillation and, and got really sick and, and had and, I, and the first operation almost killed me and the second one cured me. I had prostate cancer three years ago, which I'm told I'm okay with it, but you know, that's cancer. And that means that yeah. that's cancer. You know, you never Absolutely. not think it, all it takes is one cell. Mm -hmm. I, you know, women, I, I've learned the difference in prostate cancer and breast cancer. Women are far more sharing about their breast cancer with their friends and support groups. Men don't talk about prostate cancer. You know, like you gotta really dig deep to hear a guy talk about it. I said to myself, I'll be the, 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 the center point of zero cancer this year. Someone's got to talk about it. You know, I hate that phrase of, oh, if I can save one person's life today, I've done. but the fact is if I can save one person's life today or have someone think about it, it's better than not thinking about it. So all of these things pile up in your life and then you start saying, what's the value of your life? You know, is, is the value of life that you play in front of 100,000 people and make records and all that shit? There's a value to that, that's fun. That's fun, as you get older, everything changes. The priorities totally change. I think David Bowie said, the only thing good for celebrities is that you can get a good seat at a restaurant. And I think Tony Danza said, the only thing good about being a celebrity is you can get a good reservation and a good doctor. I agree on both of those counts. That's the value of the celebrity I have. I can get a good doctor and people know me enough to be able to do that. I don't really need to walk around the streets and have anybody bother me or take pictures of me. On the other hand, if I have a platform, and information, you know, why not help people? Yeah. Um, I've got one more question. I want to be cognizant of your time. The book ends 
so nicely on this reunion where you and D make up and, and you're able to get the rest of the band back together for uh, the Tavern on the Green show. And then you guys tour. What's your relationship like now with the rest of the band that you guys had this great ability to kind of wrap it up seemingly pretty nicely? We probably talk every day because our music is licensed so much. You know, we have a post COVID we have a successful post-COVID career because we license our music for TV commercials and, and soundtracks and all that. And most bands don't have that luxury. And we do. So when COVID hit, we didn't have to go, oh my God, we're not playing this year. Oh, this is a catastrophic economic toll. We had already walked away in 2016. I mean, look, when we walked away in 1988, that was two years before the hair band thing collapsed. I don't know if you even know this, mm -hmm. but the whole MTV poison motley crew shtick you know everyone's hair is that there's so much hairspray there's no ozone layer over la that whole period collapsed in one day smells like teen spirit came on the radio and it wiped out the dinosaurs and much the way the elvis wiped out the sinatras and the beatles wiped out the elvises nirvana wiped out the quote hair bands well, we had already stopped playing so we didn't suffer the wipeout so we came back fully formed in, uh, in 2003 the, to a world that we did not know existed, truly. We did not know the world cared. And it cared so much, it became, we became one of the most, the biggest headlining acts in the, you know, in the festival circuit for 14 years, it could have kept going. But my drummer died in 2015 and, um, of a heart attack. And in 2016, we did a 40th anniversary farewell tour. That was 40 years for me, Eddie and Dave. I had already been in the band three years before that, which is why I'm coming close to my 50th year in, in, in uh, 2022. Uh, so we've already come to terms with our adultness, our age, our families. You know, we've dealt with deaths in our families, you know, kids dying and parents dying. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and we have to do licensing agreements all day long. So we're always texting each other every other day. So when people are always amazed, and always say, do you talk, you know, do this? And yeah, I mean, it's a business. So yeah, the mundane nature of the businesses that, that we do. And the other question is, are you guys going to play again? And the answer to that, you don't even have to ask because I will just tell you, the band reformed in 2003 for two years and we lasted 14. So we were only going to get together for two years. That was the whole plan. Mm -hmm. We wanted four, and we could have gone on forever and decided after AJ's death, one more year and wrap it up. So I don't miss it at all. D is still out there as a solo artist. He's doing his thing. Mendoza has got a, a TV, a YouTube thing that he does. I um, mean, Eddie has a hot sauce and does what he does. We all got together for dinner a year ago. Do you know that we never talked about playing a gig at all at that dinner? That may say more to you about the answer to that question. Nobody said, hey man, Let's get together and play. Nobody suggested it. Well, that tells me that nobody is looking forward to it. Does that mean never? No, anything can happen. But I, you know, first of all, no one's playing or very few people are playing anyway. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm too busy with the book and my podcast and, you know, the JJ French connection beyond the music. I'm having a hell of a good time with that. So there's a lot to take up, you know, the band my bandwidth in my head writing for copper magazine which is an online audio magazine or or uh you know or, or gold mine magazine and and who knows there may be another book i i already have a title i have a working title for the book i'll tell you the working title it's called thank god i'm an atheist and i, I <laughs> and uh and uh that's going to be a really philosophical book <laughs> if that ever gets written I Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll by J.J. French is available right now wherever you get books. For more information to find out all the things that J.J.'s up to, check out his website, jjfrench.com, and you can find him on Twitter, where he is at J.J. French. You can check us out on all the various socials. 
Be sure to visit our website at rockandrollgradschool.com. And don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thank you. Good night. And may all your favorite bands stay together. <laughs>